Well, as I said, we're, we're in this Living Loud series, and, and just let me say something about, you know, we talk about being missional, and that is uh, the whole idea of being on a mission with God and, and that God is the God of mission. He is out there. He sent his son on a mission and so on, and he's a God of mission. And uh, we talk about uh, being missional ourselves, that we are to be the incarnate, the heart, the hands and feet, and so on, and, uh, and that how, you know what, we're, we're, the, we're the ones that are to be on a mission as well, too, no matter where we are. And it's not just about going overseas to some place. It's, it's about right here in our neighborhoods. It's about right here talking to people and, and so on. And, and we tried to, one of the things I tried to do, uh, about, I guess it's been about a month and a half ago now, is we talked about a couple things. For instance, we talked about being a blessing. And I'm going to talk about that and review that this morning. And we talked about eating together and so on. But let me just say right off the get-go that there are probably two big things that will hinder or sidetrack mission. And, uh, and, and the first is the whole idea of fear. Fear. You know, um, and a lot of you, you know, we had some responses. We had a few responses of people that really went out and, and sat with some people and and, uh, and some, some uh, those that didn't know the Lord and just, just spent time with them and just started relating with them and so on. But probably for a lot of people, that brings fear. That brings fear. Well, what if I don't? What if I? What if I? I don't know an answer they ask, or or what if they think I'm weird? And well, you're already weird anyway. Just let us get that out of the way, all right? But but what if they think that? What if they think that there's a, uh, that that what I said is goofy or, or or whatever it might be? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? And it it, it becomes fear, and and fear will stop mission. And I want to encourage you that if you didn't. Go out and, and have uh, uh, have a meal with somebody, or if you didn't uh, uh, ha- bless someone like we talked about, um, and it, it, to, to look back on that and say, did did I not do that because I was fearful? Did I not do that because I was I, I felt I felt like I, I I wasn't I wasn't capable of answering questions, or what if what if I did something or said something that they would think was weird or whatever. The second thing, though, that I think is hinders mission in our lives, if I can put it this way, and I'm going to, it's almost a harsh word, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, and that's laziness. That's laziness. Oh, I ain't got time for that. I, you know, I have, I, I just, you know, I just don't, you know what, I just don't have the energy for that, or so on and so forth, but yet you have the energy to do all kinds of other things. Yet you have the time to do all kinds of other things. And and I, I just wanna I just wanna encourage us this morning that you know can we possibly do we could could it be could it be possible we got our priorities out of order here? I mean we get so busy living life that we have no time to do anything else. We have we have you know no energy to do anything else. And frankly, we become lazy at this area. Now. I just throw that out as a challenge. Those are two things that I really believe will kill mission, and that is fear and laziness. I hope we hear Cornerstone. I, I really hope that Living Loud, this series Living Loud, helps us to get by those two things. But frankly, it does take a choice on our behalf. It really does take a choice. Um, you know, I think about, uh, you know, sitting down with our neighbors or, or inviting them over for coffee or something like that. I mean, okay, let's, let's if, if I could just, I'm, I know I'm meddling here a little bit, but if I could put it up like this, okay? Now here you have, uh, for instance, Seth. Seth's desire is to go into a Muslim country someday. Fair enough? All right. How many does that scare? <laughs> All right. All right, yeah. Now let's put that up to inviting your neighbors over for a cup of coffee. Seriously. I mean, there's no comparison, is there? There's really no comparison. So so I want to encourage us with that. Don't allow the mission stoppers to come into your life. The fear. The laziness. You know what? I don't know about you, but I we are in such a time when relationships
relationship with people and non-believers is so important because they're all looking for answers right now. And I believe we've got some answers. I, I want to I review just a little bit to get us back on track with some things. Um, and not that we got off track, but we had a lot of different stuff going on. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, our, one of our first things we talked about a, few week, a couple months ago was the whole idea of being a blessing. And I want to review that a little bit, and as well as I want to review the whole idea of eating together as just part of being missional. And uh, I, we here at Cornerstone, if you're new to Cornerstone today, you have to understand, we believe in being missional. We believe in, that we're here for, we're not here just to live our lives, come together and, and just sing nice songs and hear a good sermon and so on, and then go home and just go ahead and live the rest of our lives. Remember what we talked about integrity. Uh, we talked about the word integrity means complete. And the whole idea that as, as if we're going to have integrity, that means that we're the same today as we are tomorrow and that we were yesterday in regards to how we act and how we respond. So this isn't just about coming together on a Sunday morning. It's about being missional. It's about every day of our lives looking to see, God, what do you have for us today? And then being willing to do it. But although this is this was mainly that message was mainly about blessing others, we first touched on a few ways that God blesses us, and and I want to just share just a re, in review a little bit of that. God blesses us by number one, He blesses us by sanctifying us. Well, that's a pretty big word. What does that spiritual word mean? It means to be holy. It means to be set apart. But it also means to make productive, to make productive, and, and that's a big thing. You know what? God, he, he takes us, when he sanctifies us, he makes us productive. And productive for his kingdom. It, 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 uh, this is what God did through us, through Christ. He cleansed us and began the process of making us productive. And it's an ongoing process. You know, it talks about working out your salvation. It's a daily thing. It's a daily process of being productive and saying, God, you sanctified me and I want to be, to be productive. called a progressive sanctification, if you will. Secondly, he blesses us by giving us grace. To receive grace means we received a favor that's not deserved. We looked at a couple passages in this, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is by grace, it's not something we've done, it's not something we could do, it's something only he could do. And the Amplified Version says it this way, For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor, drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved and actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for this salvation. I'm sorry, folks. It says there's nothing you can do. God did it. It's grace. Now, it's the grace that comes when we're weak. We see it with Paul. Paul uh, Paul had a thorn, if you will. He had a thorn, and it says, you know, he prays, God, take this thorn, take this pain away from me. Whatever that pain may be in your life, you cry out, God, take this pain away from me. And God's response, and his response to Paul was, my grace is sufficient. You're going to be able, you're going to have that thorn, but I want to tell you, my grace is sufficient. I'm going to walk with you through that. In your weakness, I'm going to walk with you through that. God's grace doesn't just save us. It also strengthens us, encourages us, and enables us to go through any circumstance. What's the circumstance you're going through right now? What's the hard time you're going through right now? I want you to know that God's grace, God's grace is the answer. And he strengthens you. And I know that's pretty easy to say as we talk about that, but the fact of the matter, it's truth. It's truth. When you start to cry out in pain and you say, God, I need help with this, guess what? God's grace is there to help. He is always there to help. Third thing is God blesses us with his presence. He blesses us with his presence. He promised to never leave us or forsake us. He will always be there. We see it. Verses like Deuteronomy 31, 6, Hebrews 13, 5, and 6. It talks about he will always be there. He will never leave us or forsake us. Sometimes that's hard to grasp, especially when we face something challenging in our lives. When we face something challenging in our lives, we feel really alone, don't we? We feel, God, where in the world are you? Where have you gone? But he's actually right there. 
walking us through that circumstance, if you will, or that challenge. Nothing can be farther from the truth. God is always with us. It is one of the blessings he promises us. And the fourth thing we talked about in review is he blesses us with good gifts. Now, he blessed, you see, God, our God likes to bless us with good gifts. He loves us asking only for our willing obedience. Now, why does God bless us? We talked about why does God bless us? And we go, we went back to Genesis, and we looked at Genesis, in chapter 12, it says, and this is him speaking to Abraham, he says, I will build a great nation from you. I will bless you and make your name famous. Okay, so there he is. He's, he promises blessing. He promises to bless Abraham. And then he goes on to say, people, we, we use your name to bless other people. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. I will use you to bless all people, all, all the people on the earth. I want you to say that last line with me, would you? I will use you to bless all the people on earth. So there's this idea, there's this, there's this whole dimension of our lives to where we are blessed, but we aren't blessed just so we have a blessed life. We aren't blessed just so it's we get all these blessings. We're blessed so that we can be a blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing. Say that with me. We're blessed to be a blessing. And we talked about that. And this was all in the framework of being a blessing as a way to be to live loud. Now, uh, it's clear that God wanted his people to represent something to him to the nations. And how would that happen? Through blessing others. And we do that by duplicating how God blesses us. So if we take those four things again and we look at those four things and, and we turn that around, well, how does that play out for us? Okay, how do we do the whole idea of blessing that if God blesses us and we want to bless others the same way God blesses us, how can we do that? Well, let's get a little bit more practical. First, it says it says that uh, God reached out to us before we were cleaned up. He's, he, he, I, I believe we said... Uh, uh, what was the first one we had there? It was, uh, there we go. He blesses us by sanctifying us. Now, now, I understand that we can't, quote, sanctify people like God sanctifies people. I get that. But what is what is our role in that blessing? How can we do that in a, in, in, in a practical way in, in representing God's nature of sanctifying us? And I, and I think that is that God reached out before we were cleaned up. He didn't wait for us to get all cleaned up, did he? He reached out before we got all cleaned up. Now, we can bless people by simply accepting them as they are. Now, how many of you know that are certain that there are certain people that are more unlovely than others? Right? And they're harder to love. But you know what? I can't imagine. You know what? I'm so glad I am loved by God, even though I know I'm probably hard to love sometimes. That was right on the tip of your tongue, wasn't it? Yes. So, you know, we used, we used to tell our kids, guess what? People that don't know God, guess what? They'll act like people that don't know God. Duh. Right? So why do we expect them to act, act differently? Why do we expect them to get cleaned up before we can really dig into their lives and have a relationship with them? Are you willing to reach out to the unlovely? Do you bless them? Well, God gave us grace when we do, didn't deserve it. We can bless people that have hurt, a, hurt us or simply have not been nice to us. And it's difficult sometimes. They may not deserve it. Maybe they've said something really bad to you. But are you offering the same grace that God offers you? We should be the greatest grace givers on the planet because we've received so much grace. We talked about, remember I talked about Alcoholics Anonymous on on their Just for Today card. One of the things this thing says this, I will do somebody a good turn and not get found out. And if anybody knows of it, it will not count. I really like that. It's not about getting, it's not about getting attention about it, uh, on that. It's about doing it uh, and not without any strings attached. Thirdly, God is present with us at all times. He blesses us with his presence. He will never leave us, forsake us. But I, well, you know what? We look at that from a standpoint of a humanness. I can see, I, you know, I can tell Jacoby, Jacoby, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Well, that's probably a lie somewhere along the line, isn't it? Because we can't keep it the same way God can, can we? 
But what we can do, one of the best ways to bless people is being around them, laughing with them, eating with them, enjoying and having having a, 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 a relational time with them. Are we willing to spend time with people in casual ways, like having a cup of coffee or lunch with them, or maybe even something more intensive, like visiting when they're sick or babysitting their kids, bringing a meal or mowing their lawn? It does not take much to bless someone with your presence, just going over and sitting with a cup of coffee and saying, hey, just come over to visit and talk. God gives us good gifts because it gives him pleasure to do so. Blessing others can be as simple as giving them a gift. Because God was so extravagant in his giving to us, it's a way to honor him when we bless others this way. Well, another area that we touched on is by eating together. And I'm just going to briefly go over this real quick. Much of the activity of the early Christians centered around a meal. And it was more than just having communion together. They eat a lot together. Let's look, for example... It says they worship in Acts 2, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. There was something going on in the, in the early church where they enjoyed being with each other. They shared a meal together. It says in Acts chapter 20, then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. And I haven't got time, haven't got time this morning to go into the whole dynamic of, of uh uh, of uh, the Lord's Supper, or the meal, the uh, so on that they had, but they ate together as a way of relating together. It was not only a practice that was used as a way of fellowship and having communion, but a way to spend time with unbelievers. It was a great missional opportunity. I once read an interesting question. Why did Jesus come to earth? Remember we talked about that? Well, most people would immediately say something about him coming to save the world and so on, be a ransom for us, which is all true. However, Scripture says three specific reasons why the Son of Man, Jesus, came to earth. Let's look at that real quickly. It says, first of all, it says in Mark 10, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, Luke 19.10, 10, to seek and to save the lost. Those are all pretty common, aren't they? We all know those. But interestingly enough, the last one is he came eating and drinking. He came eating and drinking. In other words, he came, he went to people's houses, he sat with them at their tables. He, In fact, he, was, he got in trouble from the Pharisees for sitting with the sinners as they ate and so on. So there's something, how many of you know there's something about food that breaks down all kinds of barriers? When you sit across from somebody and you're having a meal together, how many here like to eat? How many here are lying to me right now? I mean, you know, we all like to eat. And there's something about having somebody over to your house and having a meal together, or going out for supper with somebody. It, it breaks down those walls, and, and all of a sudden you have something in common. You're eating together. And through that time, the door opens, and you're able to start to hear what's on their heart, and they can hear what's on yours. He said there, the first two have to do with why he came, and the last one is about how he came, eating and drinking. In other words, his mission strategy was basically to have a meal with people. Part of that strategy. You know, there's something that happens again when you sit across the table from each other. We share, we share stories, don't we? We have people come over to our house, we end up sharing stories, and we start to laugh and everything like that, and we start to have, build a relationship. Well, that's a little bit of review and a long review probably, but I want to get to something else today that I think is just a, that, that's key and paramount to both of those things, both of those items, and that has to do with listening. It's the ability to listen, and when we talk about and this message is actually called Living Loud by Listening. What do we mean by listening? Well, again, yeah, you, you see, we're, we're talking about this Living Loud series to go beyond the norm. Uh, I want to suggest that we as Christ followers need to work in the area of listening, to go beyond the normal, to listen more. Because listening is learning to give attention, concentrating, and being attentive, all of which require practice. One thing we didn't do this morning. I'd like everybody to just kind of, kind of get up and greet each other this morning. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Just go up and greet, greet each other. Stand up, greet each other, go find somebody. Go be.
there. Good morning. You as well. You're not going to get it, are you? All right, if you can find your seats now. Stay here. All right, now. So it's, it's always a train wreck when that happens, which which is great. It's a good train wreck. Now, you kind of people kind of thought, well, that's kind of random, Jay. That's kind of weird. But I want you to know that there was a purpose in that. While you were doing all that, Jacoby Mack was back there, reading a scripture out loud. And Greg Morley was trying to hear him read that scripture. What did you hear, Greg Morley? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, stay there, Jacoby. When we talk about listening, that was an illustration. Why could not why couldn't Greg hear Jacoby back there? Why? There was so much noise. There was so many people talking. There was so much going on. Does that remind you of anything? When we talk about listening, the very first thing we have to understand is there's a lot of noise. And if we're going to hear God, and if we're going to hear people, then we've got to listen. We've got to learn to listen. Now I want to start off with about hearing the Holy Spirit, which I believe is so key. It's everything to this as far as I'm concerned. Everything to being missional is hearing the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to ask you something. How many of you take literally take time to get away from all the noise to hear the Holy Spirit. Now let's face it. Many of us don't even have time to do that. What I want you to do now, I want you to, we're going we're gonna to get as quiet as we can. Now I understand there's still going to be a little noise now and again. That's our lives. But I want you to get as quiet as you can, starting right now. Why didn't you hear that the first time? Because there was too much noise. Because there was too much noise. Too much noise. I want to talk about listening to the Holy Spirit. There's going to be two areas that I want to finish off with this morning as far as listening goes. You know, it says, it's interesting because it says, John 10, 27, 28, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. It says, My sheep hear my voice. How many here are hearing God's voice? And maybe the reason you're not hearing God's voice is because there's too much noise. We are so busy. We are such a noise-driven society. In fact, going out of Revelation, it says, 
Jesus, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Maybe we just need to say eat American, but anyway. But it's the idea that hearing God's voice. Many of my extended, my, my family is really bad with hearing. We, for some reason, we've got a bad thing going around where all my, my, my relatives have struggle hearing. Isn't that right, Mom? Oh, she didn't hear that. This is a thought. Sorry. But uh, my kids give me a hard time because sometimes I don't hear very well. When I was a kid, I drove a tractor, and, and the tractor would have the throttle full, and I had this big old radio on the fender that I turned square up over that so I could hear the, the radio. Probably damaged some of my ears and my hearing as well. But I don't hear very good sometimes. And I struggle in a big room, particularly, hearing someone I'm talking to right there because of all the other noise. And so I've become a pretty good lip reader. That's what you do, isn't it? But see, there are just so many voices. It's hard to hear. It's hard to hear. It's the same for hearing the Holy Spirit. Sometimes there are too many voices hear Jesus clearly. You know, if we truly want to be led by the Spirit when it comes to blessing people and knowing who God is leading us to, then we need to hear the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Well, first of all, and this is what I want to challenge us with today in regards to hearing the Holy Spirit, is that is create space to hear God. Create space to hear. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is carve out time. And it's almost, I feel almost bad saying this. Carve out time of your busy schedule to take time just to listen for the Holy Spirit. One of the, I don't know if you shared the story about when, uh, <laughs> when I was, I used to, when I was up in the ocean, I would go to a, uh, every day I would go down to a, a uh, river. There was a dam there, and I'd sit there, and I'd worship, and I'd, or I'd sing, and I'd, I'd pray, and I'd listen. And one of the things that I did to start with is I prayed, God, uh, one of the very first things I would always say, not think anything about it, I'd say, God, will you order my day? So I would be, it was really quiet, and I'd be playing my guitar a little bit, and and praying, and so on, then I'd stop, and I'd listen. And I got frustrated because these things that I needed to do would come into my mind. And I shared that with one, I shared that with a pastor one day, a good friend of mine, and, and I said, I said, Dwayne, this is what I'm having trouble with. When I, when I go to my prayer time, and, and, and so on, and, and he said back to me, he said, well, didn't you ask God to order your day? I said, yeah. What do you think he was doing? He was telling me today, I want you to do this. Today, I want you to do this. And so I started taking a notebook with me. And I started to write down what I heard. And it was amazing. I had more energy. I got everything done. And that's because I listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And see, the problem was, I was thinking that that was, you know, I didn't even know that, that was him speaking to me at that time. But once I started to understand that and get quiet before him, then he ordered my day. Did you know that God wants to do that with you? The problem is, is we don't have time to do that. We have such busy schedules that we can't carve out any time to do that. It's interesting. I know this. I know the context of this verse, but I just want to use Matthew six six. And this is the whole idea about don't go praying on the corner and so on and so forth, so everybody can see you like the Pharisee does and so on. But look what it says here. When you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. 
Now, the whole idea that I want to say in that whole thing is it says, go into your room, shut the door. In other words, get in some place where you can shut this noise out. If you truly want to hear me, if you truly want to be to do what I've called you to do, what's on my, if you truly want to hear what's on my heart, if you truly want to be missional and you want to be directed to do, to, to be missional, then you need to get to some place where you can hear my voice. It says that Jesus, it's as if Jesus knew we'd be prone to distractions and surrounded by noise. So he gives the suggestions of being alone, shutting the door, being in private. I, uh, there's, a, there's a quote by uh, a guy by the name of Bruce Demarest that writes, a quieted heart is our best preparation for all this work of God. The goal is to simply permit the Holy Spirit to activate the life-giving word of God. I like that. I like that. In the Gospels, we see Jesus going off by himself to be alone to listen to the Father. You know, introverts and extroverts, they handle this differently. It's often hard for extroverts because they like to spend time relating to people. Hey, let's go here. Let's go there. Let's talk to this person. That, uh, that's the next area. They always want people around. And they never hear the voice of God. Now, granted, on the other side, there are introverts, too, that might hear the voice of God but never get off their knees to do it. So there's dangers on both sides. But taking time to listen. Can I challenge you to carve out a significant chunk of time this week to listen to the Holy Spirit. I want to challenge you to do that. And, and I sit there and I said, I said uh, we were talking about that. I was talking with Sandy about that. How much is a chunk of time? Two minutes? Does that, that seems like, I don't know about you, but if I'm asked, if, if somebody tells me to take a chunk of cake, I'm going to take a chunk of cake. And it's not going to be just this little piece. The second area we want to need to work on in this whole whole dynamic of being missional and with people and, and eating with them and spending and blessing them and so on is, is to listen to people. So Jacoby, what are you doing tonight? So yeah. Anyway, what did you what did you want to say to me? Um, yeah. What what was that again? I, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. What was that again? I would just say just hang on a second. Just can you just hold on a second? Like, oh, come on. This phone just doesn't work right anymore. Do you understand? That's how we talk to people. Come on. Let's be honest about it. That's how we talk to people. It drives me bananas when I'm trying to talk to my wife and she is texting somebody. But that's... You know what? I will tell a story about that. And this isn't about her. I would, when I was pastoring up in Goshen, I was pastoring up in Goshen, and I talked to this gentleman one day, and he came up to me, and he started talking to me. He says, you know what, Jay? You never listened to me. You never listened to what I said. I was appalled. Of course, Carl, I listened to what you said. He said, you know what he said to me? He said, you know, you, you don't listen to me. You know why? Because when I'm talking to you, you're looking at this person, that person, this person over here. And I, you know what? I, you know what I said to him? You're right. I had to say that because I knew it was truth. If we are going to be missional with those around us, you know what? I got a novel idea for you. Look them in the eyes when they talk. That may, that may creep them out. I don't know, but 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 look, but start communicating. Start communicating in a way that they believe. See, I want to tell you something. When I said did that to Jacoby, you know what the message I'm sending to Jacoby is? I really don't know. I really don't care what you're saying. I'm busy over here. And you know what else that sends? That sends him a message of value. You really don't really care what I got to say anyway. Just like it did with my buddy in Goshen. Listen to people. Part of listening is actually looking at them. Novel idea. We're in an age.
age of electronics, the temptation is to be half there in a conversation. I got, there's some, I got some, well, actually, my wife found these for me. I thought these were pretty good. Put your phone down. Your text will be there later. The person in front of you won't. Now, you may have seen that one before. This one says, turn off the phone and be present. I like that. <laughs> one of my favorites is this last one. Please put your phone down and kind of look at me in the eye. If you choose otherwise, I'll have to gouge yours. <laughs> you like that one, Spike? Yeah, you like that one. That a boy. Being distracted will not lead to an openness in people. It will send a message that what they say is not really important. In addition to not looking at people, we often are trying to think about how we're going to respond to what they're saying before they're even done saying it. We're trying to think about how we're going to respond. I believe truly listening to people will open doors of opportunity for bringing Jesus into the conversation. I'm going to say something maybe real uncomfortable here. Don't be afraid to go deep with that person if this opportunity presents itself. Ooh. What do you mean go deep? Ask them personal questions? No, you can't be saying that, Jay. That's exactly what I'm saying. You know why? Because we live in this world where everybody's got their mask on. We live in this world where everything's superficial. We talk about the niceties of life. We may share a struggle now and again, but we never go deep. Can I encourage you that if the door opens to go deep with someone, maybe they share, hey, this is what I'm dealing with at work, or maybe they're my child or whatever it is, go deep with them. Don't be afraid of that. That's again where that fear comes in. Oh, man, they just said something real deep. Now what am I going to do? Oh, okay, yeah, thanks for sharing that with me. I'll pray about that. I'm not trying to make fun about praying about it. But you understand what I'm saying. Go deeper. To me, that's a cry. And, 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 and to me, that's a cry that says, I need to talk about this with someone. I'm hurting. Don't be afraid to go deep. We have this thing in our family. To much of our my son's chagrin, to my, uh, my daughter-in-law's and, and daughter's love, and my wife, and that is at our, at our holiday gatherings. We actually take time without the kids, we, but without the grandkids, yeah, and we have a serious time with each other. So we go around the circle, and we talk about what's going on in our life. What are you laughing for, Olivia? That's exactly right. The guys laugh and the girls cry. But in the end, it becomes the time when we're really honest with each other. And it becomes the time that everyone trusts you. Don't be afraid to go deeper. Now, we talked about today, we talked about being a blessing, we talked about eating together, and we talked about listening. What I'm going to do right now is I want to just throw open for some of you that have had. Have, have, have dealt with this issue of quiet time and getting away and listening to God. There are some, I, I, I'm going to guess there are some that, that, that have, have really have made a habit of this. And I, th and I say that we need to make a habit of it. How did you do that? How did you do that? Don't be afraid to say nobody's going to think you're bragging. Nobody thinks you're, they're going to think you're super spiritual because you do that. But how did you do that? Maybe that might spur on somebody else's, in somebody else's mind of how to do that. Anybody? Anybody want to share? Be bold enough to share. You, well, what do you mean by that? Okay, so that's what you've done. You've worked, well, you woke up a little earlier just for the car about that time. Yeah. Hi, guys. That's 
Right, it is a sacrifice, isn't it? You mean you actually turned your TV off? That's a novel idea. We call it the box. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Having coffee with God. I bet God's coffee is really good too. I just bet you. Yeah, Denise. Yes. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, that's good. And one of the things I'll say to that too is often our prayer time is us talking. Can I encourage you that that's only part of it? The other part of it is us listening. Try that. Who else? Yeah, Melly. You know, we're on a journey with this. All of us are. Let's face it. We're all on a journey with this. Because we all get pulled away. We all allow things to clutter our lives. My challenge. <laughs> so my wife and I were talking this morning about what is a chunk of time. So I'm going to throw out this to you. Five hours a day. No, no, I'm only, I'm only kidding. I'm not Okay, that's a big piece of cake, huh? If you want to, that's fantastic. That is great. I'm going to start small. Because I know this may be, for even some, this may be over the top. I'm going to ask you to spend 15 minutes a day. Carve out a time. 15 minutes a day, that's all I'm asking. And can I encourage you that during that time, don't maybe don't say a lot. Now you can come back and say, "Well, I'm, I don't, I didn't hear anything." Well, you know what? What you are doing though is tuning your ear and you're removing the clutter. And believe it or not, God speaks today. And he will speak to you if we continue to turn our tune our ears. And if He sees that you're desire is to hear him. Then he's going to speak to you. Amen? And maybe some of these ideas help you. Maybe one of the most maybe getting up earlier or whatever. Maybe that's what that needs to happen. Okay. Anyway, listening. Listening to the Holy Spirit and listening to other people are key to what we talk about really being mission. Amen? Let's stand as we close. Well, Father, it seems as though many times I busy or get farther the less time we spend with you. The less time we spend listening to your voice. Oh God, we know that you want to speak to us. 
in the midst of what we're doing, but you also want to speak to us even before we do it to direct us, to direct our path. Holy Spirit of God, we pray. I pray that this week that as people take time, as people take that 15 minutes a day, that Lord God, they would clearly start to hear your voice. Lord, I pray that as the clutter starts to, as people find their place and clear their minds and get away from all the noise and the clutter, that they would hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to you.